Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Stephanie Leffler. I'm really excited to talk who's led multiple successful software startups. If we had all day, we probably still wouldn't get to all the amazing stuff she did. She co-founded Crowdsource, which specializes in providing an elastic labor force for large companies who manage huge bodies of content. To give you an idea, Crowdsource works with companies such as Bed Bath & Beyond, Orbitz, Target, Groupon, Coca-Cola, and many more, has a workforce of 250,000 people. Prior to Crowdsource, Stephanie co-founded Monster Commerce with Ryan Noble, and it's an e-commerce platform that grew to over 8,000 small businesses with annual sales exceeding $20 million and was supported by a staff of 200 people. And Stephanie was awarded Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year finalist recognition for the outstanding success of Crowdsource. And not to mention this, she also co-founded in 2008 Juggle, which grew to a network of websites serving 70 million unique visitors. Stephanie, thanks for joining me. Sure, happy to be here. I'm really excited to hear the big lessons learned, big mistakes, what worked, what didn't work in your journey. And I always like to include a fun fact um, before we start. And a fun fact, you know, I always send people a bucket list. You know, and you put the what I expect. You know, Marissa May, people you want to meet: Marissa Mayer, Meg Whitman, and the third one was Ryan Seacrest. And yeah. that that surprised me. Why is Ryan Seacrest? Well, I would say um, a I'm a huge American Idol fan. Okay. Uh, not necessarily publicly, but definitely privately. Okay. Um, but you know, Ryan Seacrest is a person who has managed to through kind of the ups and downs of, of popularity of American Idol has managed to know what he's good at mm -hmm. and stay the course. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you see people and, and that's kind of like a serious answer as it relates to a guy like <laughs> Ryan Seacrest, but right. really, you know, it's, you know, you see former athletes uh, kind of decide they're going to be done being an athlete and become a real estate developer and it doesn't go well. But mm -hmm. Ryan Seacrest is one of those people that, you know, he, he, respects his niche, he mm -hmm. sticks with it, and uh, it has certainly served him well. I like that. So what would you say you are good at? Like what's oh, your wow. superpower? I would say my superpower is uh, kind of a help and a hindrance, but I just, I don't give up. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, um, I don't kind of, I don't take no for an answer. I mean, I'll take no for an answer, but all it does is tell me I need to ultimately get what I'm trying to achieve a different way. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, it probably would have been better to give up. <laughs> like in which case? Um, I think this is important, especially as an entrepreneur. Like what if you're headed on the wrong path? Should you keep going or are you on the right, you know, if it's not, you're not getting traction? Yeah, I think honestly, I think that so I can think of several business scenarios where you know, not not necessarily for, with a company as a whole, but a particular mm -hmm. product within yeah. within the company. Um, you know, being passionate about it and committed to it mm -hmm. can sometimes cause you to uh, not not look at the hard facts and mm -hmm. make a good decision based on the facts. Um, I think that kind of ability to get passionately committed to something is also mm -hmm. though what what makes you successful. So it's you know it's a it's a gut decision sometimes, mm -hmm. but I can definitely think of. Uh, certain products where it probably was time to pull the plug before I did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so also you've been, it sounds like with Ryan, you've been partners in several companies. So how do you guys, um, I guess, match up as far as, um, you know, complement each other and how, what things have you to work through? Cause obviously it's not always hunky dory. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, well, a, a couple of years ago we had a, a group come in and actually do, um, kind of not personality assessments, but uh, they assessed how you work and how you interact with mm -hmm. other people as it relates to being part of a leadership team. And mm -hmm. I remember the day they sat down to review our results and told us that they had never seen two people work together who were more arch opposite really? than Ryan and I are. Yes. Um, it I was, thought you were going to say the opposite. So you're, no, you're opposite. It was, uh, it was literally hilarious. The graphs were just X's across the board. It's like, you're high on this and he's low on that. But no, so I, I think that's why we've been able to be successful. Um, Ryan is very high level and very 50,000 foot view. Um, he has absolutely been 
the driving force behind all of the ideas that have ultimately led us to success. Mm -hmm. um, I would say he has an uncanny ability to, to separate out noise from very important things. And probably if you paid him a billion dollars, he would sometimes have trouble like executing from a very detail oriented standpoint, what it takes to actually achieve the vision. Right. Um, I, on the other hand, am really tactical. Like I love, absolutely love solving problems. I love rolling up my sleeves and kind of getting into the nitty gritty and it makes me pretty tactical. But I'm not, a I'm not great at separating out the noise from the big ideas. I like that high level, um, but I have trouble figuring out what's really important versus what might be a distraction, whereas he can do that. So you know, I think we've both learned to rely on our strengths and um, you know, so I've always kind of taken that execution oriented role. He's always taken that higher level, um, forward looking mm -hmm. role and it's, it's served us well so yeah. far. So Stephanie, what, what, what were some of those big ideas that have led to the success and then how you actually tactically implemented them? Sure. So a good example, um, well, there are several, but I'll give you one from the monster commerce days. Yeah. Uh, so we have been selling e-commerce software to small businesses for, I don't know, probably four years at this point. And, you know, we had grown a successful customer base. Um, they all subscribed to our e-commerce software. So software as a service, yeah. we had a lot of add-on services. We sold them. Most of those add-on services were all ideas that Ryan had conceptualized and said, Hey, we can make our clients more successful if we offer them design or if we offer them, you know, search engine placement. And it sounds probably, uh, you know, pretty obvious now, but back then it actually it wasn't was right. Cause when did, <laughs> when did you start that company? Uh, 2000, 2000. Okay. Yeah. So 2001, 2002 were yeah. kind of our major building years there. Um, but you know, we got to the point that we were growing pretty steadily, but we also saw a lot of churn and that makes sense in the small business space, you know, half of small businesses fail. And so we were always trying to think of what could we do to make our clients more successful. Right. We saw a huge drop off in churn. If we could get them to get one sale, a month versus zero sales a month. It was a really massive difference. And so um, Ryan was out, you know, always thinking about this and he came up with the idea to start a shopping comparison engine. You know, we knew about how to build websites, how to promote products. Our customers really didn't in a lot of cases. Right. And so we said, let's build a shopping comparison engine. We have all their product information it's sitting here in our platform and we can bring it in and we will promote the site. We'll optimize it for search engines and we'll, you know, kind of help them get sales that way. And so we launched the site and um, in the process of launching the site, uh, he got a search deal done with Google for their enterprise search appliance. That was how you could actually search for products on our shopping comparison engine. And they said, hey, we've got this new thing called AdSense. Do you want to try it? And so we said, sure, we'll try it. And it was that was Google's very beta program for syndicating ads, which, you know, I, I don't know, uh, you know, how kind of ad savvy your your uh, audience is, but those are that's the way Google makes probably more than half of their revenue right. when it comes to advertising, yeah. uh, selling placement on other people's sites. So we launched it in the first day. You know, the site I think maybe made two hundred dollars from this advertising product. We never expected to have it be a revenue generation engine directly, right. and we were like, "Wow, that's great!" And then the second day it made five hundred, and the third day it made three thousand, and that trend on a daily basis continued wow. until a year later, that site ended up being the the majority of our revenue. It was more than 50% of our revenue. Really? Holy cow. Uh, yeah. And, you know, when you think about it, uh, very few people and very few man hours were required to operate that site. Right. It also drove billion, literally billions in do of dollars in sales to our merchants right. over time. And it succeeded in its goal of reducing churn. But in that case, Ryan conceptualized it, got it started. But after the first month of saying, yep, it works, you know, he was kind of on to the next thing. And I took the reins and helped build the team that actually created you know, a kind of a detailed management platform that helped us figure out what traffic was helping our customers and what traffic wasn't. And you know, how to sort of manage it at scale. And so that's just an example of, you know, how we've kind of always worked. Love that. Yeah. So what was the, do you remember the best day you had with Google AdSense? From a dollar standpoint? Yes. I do. It was a lot. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Und- yeah. undisclosed it amount. was in the it was uh, more than a hundred thousand dollars in revenue wow unbelievable so yeah. what did you what did you find when you were looking at the different traffic sources um that was working on a tactical level or not working yeah so back then you know the kind of the secondary market was emerging so you could go buy traffic from google or you could buy traffic from yahoo at the time mm-hmm. there were a lot of other places that were just kind of i guess getting started where you could buy traffic and the reality was not just buy traffic but you could get traffic a lot of those sources were really good and a lot of them were really bad but the reality is the market has changed so massively that anything that was good or bad back then is now completely different. But um, I guess the biggest takeaway is that it's probably the same today that, you know, there are some places that have the right target audience for your product. And there are other places that just don't through one way or another, Mm -hmm. but um, the internet's one of those crazy places that, you know, advice is only good for probably six months. Right. (laughs) Things are changing all the time. So with monster commerce, what was a big – I wanted to find out what um, a big lesson was that you learned from Monster Commerce before moving on because Juggle was the next, right? Mm-hmm. Was Juggle the next business? Yeah, a big lesson and a, uh, a turning point where you had a big breakthrough with uh, Monster Commerce. Um, so I would say – I mean, geez, it's, it's hard to kind of break it down into one, but um, ultimately – I would say the biggest lesson was that kind of towards the end of our run at Monster Commerce, at the time we didn't know it was towards the end of our run, but you know we had opportunities from several companies who were looking at us and thinking about acquiring us. And as we thought about those opportunities, I think normally you think you know you think about money and it's all of that you know what the value is somebody's going to offer. But mm-hmm. what I learned in that process is that you know you have a team of people; they've all looked to you been there with you through thick and thin. And when you complete that acquisition, you want to make sure that you're setting that team of people up for something that's going to be good for them for years to come. So that when you think about it as a whole, you feel really good about not just what you built in the beginning, but kind of like what you ultimately created. And, you know, we ended up deciding between three different companies uh, that were thinking about acquiring us, uh, one of which was pretty open about the fact that they would probably, you know, get rid of most of our team. Disband everyone. Yeah, move a few of us out to California and, you know, be great. Uh, Another one who was, you know, a little bit of that, not quite as extreme. And then the third who we ultimately chose said, hey, listen, we see a whole lot of value in St. Louis. We want to build out a team there and grow um by three times the team that you've started you know these Mm -hmm. people could be leaders in the new organization and so we decided to do that uh take option three which um you know i was really happy that we did that and when i look at how things ultimately pay you back you know i look at call it that original monster commerce uh pledge class if you will and what they have gone on to do and it is amazing the reach of those 200 and plus people across the internet and the number of companies that they're a part of and kind of the position of influence that they've grown to over mm-hmm. time. Um, but I'm really thankful that we ended up with an environment that cultivated that type of leadership and, and, you know, entrepreneurial spirit that's gone out into the market because it's funny, some of those things are now already starting to pay us back where old team members of mine are, whether it's customers of crowdsource or, you know, sending business here or yeah. referring new team members. I feel like if I would have gone a different route, you know, yeah. in the long term, it would not have paid the way that it has. Yeah, it kind of went full, full circle yeah, with exactly. those people. So, yeah. what? Obviously, it was a huge success. What was the hardest part about running Monster Commerce? Um, you know, the hardest part was. Uh, it's funny, you know, it, it doesn't, looking back on it, it all felt somewhat hard, but it was fun because, you know, you, you don't know what you don't know. So every day is just about figuring it out. Um, mm. And if anything, it was some of the, uh, the, the decision to sell the company or not. I'd say of, of every single thing that if I had to break it down to one hardest thing, um, it's trying to decide whether the time is right. Yeah. 
So you know, what were some of the pit? What's that? I said, you never want to leave opportunity on the table. So yeah. it makes it difficult. But in your first venture, you know, I had a few hundred dollars in my checking account the whole time I ran Monster Commerce. So it's, uh, you know, you get to a point where it's a big decision of whether you're going right. to take take some chips off the table or not. It's a huge decision. Yeah. Yes. What yeah. are some of the pitfalls people should watch out for when running, you know, a big company like that? Um. I would say you got to be able to do, you have to do everything. So what I mean, what I mean is that when I, when you're trying to do a startup, the most important thing is that you have a strong team and the way you build a strong team is you have to be able to identify really with each and every member of that team. So whether it's answering the phone some days when the person who normally answers your phone is sick or it's, uh, you know, jumping in and helping a team on a project that they can't figure out. It doesn't matter what it is. The point is that the best way to get your team's respect is to show them that you're right there, you're doing it with them. And, you know, it's, it's not, you know, you're not kind of sitting in an office and delegating instructions and don't really have any idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd say you just have to make sure to stay connected with your team. So after Monster Commerce, Stephanie, then what'd you do next? So, um, after selling the company, both Ryan and I stayed on at Network Solutions for about 18 months, um, which is actually a great, great experience. I mean, getting to integrate a co two companies like that was a huge learning experience. Um, Network Solutions at the time actually had a really uh, exciting business. They were growing from being just a domain company into a company that served all uh, types of small businesses. And so we, Ryan and I both had a really integral role in their growth after the acquisition. Uh, but after we got through the point that, you know, the integration, like, you know, I said, my goal in this is to ask our CEO, who at the time was Champ Mitchell, you know, I want to ask him a year from now if he sees this acquisition as successful or not. And I'm going to do everything in my power to have him answer absolutely. And, you know, after 18 months of being there, Network Solutions sold the newly combined company to a private equity firm for many times the investor's uh, investment. And so if you would ask them if it was a success, yes. they would say, absolutely. And so that was a good feeling. I, you know, it's like, you always want both sides of a transaction right. to be seen as a good thing. And so at that point, you know, I kind of felt like our job there was done and uh, we decided to take some time off. We actually uh, bought an RV and loaded our dogs up and decided to take a year and drive across the country. All right. Um, <laughs> yep. That was, uh, it was a very exciting idea, and we started off, and I always tell people, we stopped in South Dakota, which is not far from here in the grand scheme of things, and bought whiteboards at Walmart, and I knew that it was the beginning of the end of it's our over. trip. Yeah. So, yeah, pretty much. So I think uh, something like three months in, we turned around and headed back to St. Louis and got an office and started work on Juggle, which was uh, – an information resource website was kind of how it started, better, more structured Wikipedia. And uh, we started, you know, building that to take a lot of the things that we had learned in the publishing business with our shopping comparison engine and apply it to kind of a new vertical. So, I mean, how'd you come up with Juggle? I'm always curious because, you know, people have all these ideas. I'm sure both of you have great ideas and lots of them. How do you decide to go with that? And what got what got chopped off that you still think would have been a good idea, but you didn't decide for whatever reason? Oh, that's a fun, that's a good question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that. So um, we actually, so those whiteboards were specifically for that, was to put what we decided we were going to do is start to write down problems that we thought needed solving. Right. And so that whiteboard had a lot of ideas. So some of the ones that were on there that fell off, mm -hmm. um, were one was a, an idea for for family photos you know at the time um i would say digital photo sharing still wasn't quite as advanced or ubiquitous as it is now but we knew that lots of people had giant boxes of family photos all over their house sitting in attics waiting to get flooded and so we wanted to build kind of not just a a company that would help you get them scanned but also one that would help you completely organize them so you'd have a very you know, great way to solve a big them. problem. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So that was one that was definitely kind of stayed on the board for longer than others that ultimately uh, we decided mm -hmm. to set aside just because of the infrastructure requirements to make that happen was mm -hmm. more than we felt like we were good at. Um, 
Other ideas were, uh, I guess, call it variations of juggle. So a straight question and answer website uh, was a big one. Um, another one was uh, just so or ultimately we ended up on kind of a, a call it a better Wikipedia. That was what juggle ended up being. But mm-hmm. we had other variations of that where it was, you know, less structured, more user generated. And ultimately we said, Wikipedia is amazing. It's kind of one of the most amazing things that has happened to the world, but it's highly unstructured, which makes it difficult to do things with the data that's contained. And so that was ultimately where we started with Juggle. So what'd you do next? How did you get the domain? (laughs) Juggle's a phenomenal domain. Was it hard to acquire that? Um, Yeah, so that's interesting. So we learned a lot about domain names at BNet Network Solutions. Mm -hmm. And... Um, They're like, we'll, we'll give you any domain you want. Just ask us. We'll kick the yeah. other person off. No, <laughs> no, we, well, you know, it wasn't even like that. But we just, you know, don't, a lot of domains expired. Juggle didn't happen to be one of those. It was, it was for sale. But what we did is we said, let's not worry about the domain. Let's get the idea right. Mm-hmm. And then ultimately, we wanted a one-word verb. That was the, at the end of the day, what we were looking for. Mm-hmm. And so that was the one that of all of the ones out there that stood out. Mm-hmm. So then, buy it from from the person who owned it. Okay. So, what were some of the big uh, breakthroughs with Juggle when you first started, or later? Yeah. So, some of the big breakthroughs were um, just figuring out how to actually structure the information, which is a really nerdy thing to be excited about. But we were pretty excited about it. Uh, we ultimately based our structure on uh, a company called Freebase um, that had started roughly the same time, who was kind of building a database of the world's information. They were subsequently acquired by Google and now power Google's, uh, their Google's knowledge graph. So I think we were on the right track in terms of aligning what we were doing with what they were doing. Right. Um, but probably the most valuable breakthrough of that whole process was saying, great, we now can understand what we do know, but we need a way to fill in the gaps of information. So if we know that, you know, Michael Jordan was a basketball player and basketball players should have certain facts in this set of data, you know, what was their number? What teams did they play for? What coaches did they play under? You know, those sorts of things. Um, We could tell what we were missing. And so we started to leverage a group of workers who were not in our building. We didn't want to build a huge team of like researchers to get this information. We were trying to come up with creative ways to use people on the internet to get it. And uh, in that process, we found Amazon Mechanical Turk, which was kind of the, the very first light bulb moment related to what ultimately became crowdsource. But we said, hey, this would be interesting. I wonder if we could launch tasks to these guys and have them help us fill in these facts. Yeah. And so that was that was definitely the biggest light bulb moment yeah. in the time period. I mean with Juggle, like I was saying, it's it was a network of sites that had seventy million unique visitors. That's unbelievable. So what were some of the breakthroughs with getting traffic? So I mean in that sense, we were already pretty good at getting traffic. Um, you know, we knew a lot about search engine optimization. We knew about uh, where to advertise, how to advertise, how to A-B test. And so I feel like that was kind of almost, um, you know, it was sort of, we didn't have to figure that out as much as some of the other things. Mm-hmm. So, but it was more about how we actually built a site that was capable of harnessing that much traffic. So, you know, the, the whole idea of how do we get structured data across a huge number of topics so that we can harness search engine traffic related to those topics. Mm -hmm. And that was where um, it was the scale of kind of the crowdsourcing model of getting that data that allowed us to be able to draw, you know, traffic of that magnitude. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what were some of the big, uh, I guess, mistakes that maybe you modified along the way? Because, you know, like Google didn't start off as whatever they do now. And what you start off with Juggle, what what uh, you know pushed you forward, and what you like, how'd you how'd you uh, I guess modify things? So I think you know honestly the biggest mistake was that um, I feel like we were not thoroughly passionate about all aspects of that business. I mean I think we were passionate about the data and about how to make it happen and kind of the challenge of could we make this happen? But it became obvious that 
we were doing a lot of the same types of things like on a day to day basis that we had done successfully at Monster Commerce in terms of, you know, thinking about SEO and thinking about um, how to make the business engine behind Juggle run sort of the whole, uh, you know, I guess the whole advertising model, not that it doesn't work, it's incredibly successful for other people, but I think in order to be amazing at something, you have to be diehard passionate about it. Like you have to want to wake up every single morning and can't wait to, you know, get a cup of coffee fast enough to get in front of your computer and start working. And while it was like that in some aspects, it wasn't like that in all aspects. And to me that says, you know, it's not a perfect fit, but the good, the the piece that was like that was the call it the, you know, what ultimately became crowdsource, which was the piece of the business that was about, whoa, this is a completely new way to get work done in the world. Yeah. It's faster, it's better quality and it's less expensive. That was something that was super hard to ignore. And so without really even making a conscious decision, just a lot of the time and effort and energy that was going into juggle was going into that part of what we were doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for anyone who hasn't watched, I highly recommend your TEDx talk, which kind of goes into more detail yeah. about that. Um, sure. And so how did you transition then to crowdsource? So we started, so we found Mechanical Turk, as I mentioned, and Mechanical Turk is something that Amazon created basically to leverage their customers to get work done for them. So they said, hey, we have all these customers. We need things done like having people look at customer reviews and figuring out if they're okay to put on the site or not, or you know, defining product attributes, like what are the sizes and colors and all those sorts of things. And so they started paying their customers tiny amounts of money to do these tasks for them. And it grew into something called Amazon Mechanical Turk. They let other companies use it. And so we started putting tasks out and continued to start innovating. Mechanical so Turk is so, I feel it's complicated to use. Absolutely, yeah. it is. So it's difficult to get work in and get the results that you want out. Yeah. It's difficult to write appropriate instructions and know who's good and who's bad. There's all sorts of things about it yeah. that are difficult. But I remember the first day I tried it, I loaded 50,000 questions into Mechanical Turk. Wow. And in less than an hour, I had 50,000 answers. Amazing. And so that's the moment where you think, hmm, okay, this would have taken me three months minimum to get done in the old way. Right. So there's something there. So we started building software on top of Mechanical Turk to solve all of the difficulties with it. So they had an API, so we integrated with it. Mm -hmm. You know, profiling workers, who's good, who's bad, who knows how to do what, building quality control systems, you know, sending the same thing to three workers so that you could compare their answers. Right. Doing, you know, throwing out tasks that we already knew the answer to to see if we get the answer that we thought it should be back to assess somebody. Lots, I mean, more than you can imagine, ultimately the software can be- Triple checking company. everything, yeah. And in the, you know, after doing this for about a year, Amazon called us and said, hey, how are you sending so much work through Mechanical Turk? And we said, well, we built this platform on top of it. And they said, well, will you mind coming out here and showing it to us? You know, we'd love to see it. So we did that. And they said, you know, if you think about doing this more seriously for customers, we have a lot of customers that, you know, we'd love to send your way. And wow. so it got us thinking and ultimately we spun off uh, what at the time was called Scalable Workforce. Uh, and ultimately we changed the name to crowdsource but that 2011 we did that and crowdsource became a separate company and uh in not very not a very long period of time we figured out that that's where the real opportunity was mm -hmm. and you know some of the properties through juggle and uh that family of websites still run but we just don't spend time and effort really focusing on those and all of our best mm -hmm. people work on crowdsource full time so Stephanie, were you worried at all? Amazon calls you out. They're obviously a huge company. They can, was there any worry? Like we could just create this and take what they've done and make it easier for people from Mechanical Turk. Yeah, so so definitely um, in the early days, there was a lot of worry about that. So we were more, um, I guess, close to the chest with what we were doing and you know being really open with them. But uh, you know, as that relationship evolved, we realized that, you know, Mechanical Turk is part of Amazon Web Services, and Web Services is all about being a platform and letting people build cool, innovative things on top of the platform. And we realized strategically that's how Amazon thought about Mechanical Turk. Mm -hmm. And so we felt like the risk of competing with them went 
way down. And as we've evolved, you know, we serve big enterprise companies with big mm -hmm. needs. And most of the kind of users directly of Mechanical Turk are small, are smaller companies. Um, and so I think we really do serve two different places in yeah. the market. Yeah. I ask because a lot of people when they have an idea or they're doing something, they do hold it close to their chest. And I feel like sometimes if you just tell people, you know, good things happen, I guess. Definitely. So, you know, we made some calculated risk there. We demoed our platform to them because we knew it was good. And uh, we knew there was a risk going in and demoing it. But we felt like as Amazon and this tiny startup, um, worst case scenario, they took it and copied it, in which case they would still be a big company and we would always be more nimble. Right, right, uh, right you know, best case is that they saw something there that says, hey, we want to refer a lot of business to these guys. Right. And that's ultimately, you know, what did happen. But I feel like as a startup, you have to be scrappy and hiding your ideas from people who can help you like right. refine them and make them better is a dangerous game. Yeah. So how did you get some of the big customers? Like I, at the beginning of the year, I mentioned Bed Bath & Beyond, Orbit, yeah. Target. Sure. Tell us a good story when how you got one of those. Oh man, you know, it's, uh, it's so some of the initial referrals came from Amazon, but at the end of the day, our first few big customers had an enormous problem and no other way to solve it. And so whether they wanted to use a small company like us or not, they really didn't have uh, what was the problem? much of a choice. So, um, say a company like, uh, Let's take Bed Bath and Beyond. You know they're going through an e-commerce replatforming, and they have a very compressed window of time to take all of their product descriptions and change them from one format to another. Crazy That's amount of data, yeah. Yeah, crazy amount of data. You know, if you hired temps, you'd hire three hundred and fifty or four hundred of them, and it would still take them twenty-four hours the a day. <laughs> They'd have to work twenty-four yep. hours. Yeah. That's right. Yep. So, I mean, that's just an example. And then, you know, once we did it successfully for a couple of companies, you know, you can say, I guess the rest is history is that, you know, we became subject matter experts in a lot of the things mm -hmm. that big retailers and big yeah. publishers need. So, Bed Bath & Beyond had no other choice, but how did you know that they had that issue enough to call them or how did you get in, in touch with them? So, it's all just it was all just through network. So, the way it happened, um, you know, I clearly had been talking to people who I know about what we're doing. Um, Amazon also, you know, saw us as a partner and was referring business to us. And in that particular case, uh, there's a company called Power Reviews that you're probably familiar with. But Amazon had put us together with Power Reviews uh, to to talk to them about some some things. And then the CEO of Power Reviews at the time knew the folks at Bed Bath and Beyond and made a referral. You know, heard that they were having this problem and said, "Hey, you should mm -hmm. talk to these guys." Um, and that's how a lot of our, you know, our first, say, 10 clients came to mm -hmm. us. It's just word of mouth. Yeah. So, Stephanie, what was another big milestone so far with CrowdSource? Um, so, raising money. We actually decided to raise a round of uh, venture capital. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say that was a big milestone. You know, a Monster Commerce we grew it organically from day one. And so that was a... a change but um certainly allowed us yeah. to be more aggressive and grow much more quickly than we mm -hmm. could have alone yeah yeah i saw one source cited at 12 12 and a half million dollars mm -hmm. i don't know if you can verify yeah. that or not but so what yeah, do you do true. when you get that influx what do you do next so for us and for, like, um, let me ask you a question actually yeah. you know that's not easy to do we say that but raising money is not like an easy task what was what was that process like yeah, that was interesting because, you know, as, as much as I had experienced in Monster Commerce, I had never raised money before. Um, we actually uh, had a phone call from um, a, a well-known uh, Silicon Valley venture firm and mm -hmm. uh, they called us and I ended up talking to them and uh, told them, you know, hey, I'm really not interested in raising money. Mm -hmm. Ryan and I are funding this ourselves and we're comfortable with that. That's the way we've always done it. And they said, well, why don't you come out here and talk with us and just at least understand what this is all about. And so I said, all right, and did that. And I guess the way Silicon Valley works is, you know, once you have conversations like that with one firm, I don't know, somehow they all know what the other one's doing. But really? okay. uh, magically, very quickly after that, we got a lot of other phone calls and decided 
um, after thinking about it, you know, hey, we've always done this kind of the, the slow and steady, spend $1, make sure you're making a dollar and one cent type right. approach, but right. we could be a lot more aggressive if we raise money and not just the, the money, but having, um, we never under even stood with the con connections and kind of the, that whole being connected to Silicon right. Valley world could do for us. And we're here in the Midwest, somewhat isolated from that. Right. And ultimately we decided to, you know, to go ahead. We had a, a, a lot of firms who were really excited and, kind of the strategic insight that we got even in that process alone was valuable. And so we decided to, to ultimately we selected one and it was kind of of all of the firms we met with, it was the one that we liked, you know, in that sort of first round of meetings first that we ultimately chose. And uh, I'm happy we did that today at Highland Capital. They've been, they've been great. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's different when you do raise a lot of money, making sure that you're careful with it and you treat it just like you would, right. um, you, you know, if it was your own money. But I think that and that's probably one of the places where maybe we've um, been smarter than some other companies who go out and plan. I think some companies plan to raise an A, a B, a C, and a D round. They know that from the get-go. Um, but, you know, we kind of went into it and said, hey, let's raise money. Let's let Let's be more aggressive. But you know, not kind of forget the bootstrapping roots, uh, mm -hmm. you know, where we came from and how we made this work one time before. Right. And it's probably ingrained in you too. So what do you do next? Like when you get this big influx of money, what do you do? Well, I think the first thing is that, you know, it, it, clearly we had initiatives that we wanted to, that we wanted to take on. Mm -hmm. um, primarily for us, we ramped up our resources around, uh, development engineering so that we could kind of move our product ahead faster than we would have been able to otherwise. And that's really where we spent the majority of, uh, call it, you know, changed our budget, if you will, from what it was beforehand. Um, and we also just got a little bit more aggressive with our, with our sales team. But otherwise I would say, you know, we continued running things much in the same way that we otherwise would have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Stephanie, so, since it's Inspired Insider, I want to ask you two questions. One, what's the most painful moment been in business for you and then how you push through it? Um, I would say one of the most painful moments was, you know, it, once again, kind of bittersweet. But when we made the decision to take resources from the properties that had originally been juggle and move them on t into crowdsource. The moving them into crowdsource was great. That was exciting. It was really smart people. And it was kind of like a dream come true. You get all of this influx of amazing talent that you're already familiar with into crowdsource. But there's definitely a something that happens when you have to shelf, you know, kind of back burner, I guess is the right way to put it, an idea that you invested a lot of time money and effort into yeah. um even though you're consciously making that decision to deprioritize it for something else uh, it's painful to think about you know if i would have figured this out sooner if i would have made you know you look back and resources yeah. over it's like yeah, yeah you, you know you feel like there's something that you wish you could have preserved and turned into something more valuable that ultimately you didn't and you know it is what it is but uh that moment is certainly one that's kind of painful. Yeah, yeah. And as you, you know, kind of go on the upward trend with your successful businesses, what was a low point when you think back to the early days? What was a low point? Well, I, I mean, the low point actually, <laughs> the lowest point of all extends uh, all the way back before even Monster Commerce yeah. uh, was up and running. Um, when Ryan and I graduated from college, we had started an online store that was kind of the very first thing we did in business. And we uh, took a, we got a loan from a bank and bought a bunch of inventory. We were selling sun protective clothing, which now is super popular everywhere you go. Back then, uh, nobody sold it. And so, which is why we thought it was an opportunity Ahead to sell of the times, that. yeah. Yeah, but uh, you know, the, the summer had kind of come and gone and winter was starting and we hadn't really, like the online store hadn't started like getting orders and 
we had a lot of pressure. There was, we had a loan, we had a lot of inventory sitting on shelves that wasn't going anywhere. Um, I remember waiting to see when Google was going to (laughs) come to, you know, to like index our store and start showing up in searches, no real clue how to make that happen. And, you know, I remember there's an afternoon where we sat down and said, like, has this been a catastrophic (laughs) mistake, you know, to sort of not take the jobs that we were given upon graduating from college at in the traditional world and trying to do this. And, uh, you know, it was about a 24 hour period where I thought maybe I should just move back to Virginia and see if I can go big for the job that I turned down to come yeah. do this. And ultimately we decided, well, people need websites right now. And we had to build this website for this online store. So maybe we can like keep things going a little bit longer by building websites for some people, which I think was actually a course taken by lots of people <laughs> at that time. And managed to build, you know, maybe websites for five or 10 companies. And in that process realized through our own experience building an online store and through some of these other people's, how desperate the need was for like an easy to use do it yourself e-commerce platform. And, you know, fortunately it, it didn't take long for us to, well, I should say it didn't take long for Ryan to see that vision. (laughs) And, uh, and ultimately, we were able to turn you know that into something that, yeah. that turned out to be great. But yeah, that that was definitely the low point of you know when when you don't know what to do next, that's really the hardest thing. And yeah. so I think when you're at that point, the most important thing is just to make a decision. You know, make a decision of one thing that you're going to do next. You know, people always say put one foot in front of the other, but you know, it's you have to keep doing something because that's ultimately you just have to trust in the fact that if you just keep doing something, it's going to lead you where you need to go. Mm. But, um, you know, when it's not working, you also have to realize that you're, su- you're supposed to be looking at that point for, for you know, keep right. putting, doing one thing, but be looking for what that opportunity yeah. is. that's going to take you to the next yeah. level. Yeah. That is painful. What's been the proudest moment? Oh, um, so the proudest moment and the one that I'm kind of, I think we'll forever be trying to replicate was, um, you know, at monster commerce, we had a team, a big team of people. Ultimately we had, when we sold the company, we had 80 people and there was a group of people of that 80 who, you know, took pay cuts and, you know, were there from the very beginning and really helped us turn it into something amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we didn't have uh, stock options or anything like that with people at monster commerce, but there were a few people who had truly laid it on the line with us. And, you know, I was able, Ryan and I were able to call them into our office and tell them, you know, that we'd made the decision to sell the company. And not only that, but, you know, that they were going to, you know, get something out of it in in a, a very meaningful something. And so it was, you know, I realized in that whole process that I was so glad that we did that because that was actually the most satisfying part of all of it. I mean, clearly it's nice to like work that hard and have something turn out really well. But when I think about, you know, what actually makes me the happiest, what I want to do again, like selling another company or having another exit event for me is, would be great, but it actually doesn't, it's hard to explain, but it doesn't make me that excited. But Mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who are sitting in this building outside of these walls right now who have been the same way for this company and so that's the most exciting part is thinking about getting to the point that i can help all of the work that they put in turn into something really meaningful for them yeah thank you yeah thank you for sharing that and there's so much i want to ask i know you have to get to a meeting um and i mean like how do you cultivate an environment i'm not asking you to answer this but how do you cultivate that group when you are bootstrapping it that are so loyal and you know, that stay with you and just want to work no matter what. So I think that would be a great TEDx talk for you. But um, the last thing is, <laughs> Stephanie, um, just tell people where they can find you and where, what they should check out online with Crowdsource. Yeah, sure. So our website is, is crowdsource.com. Um, you can, if you want to reach out to me, you can reach out through my profile on LinkedIn. That's probably the easiest way to uh, to get a hold of me. But um Definitely uh, check it out, and I do think the TEDx talk is a good good background yeah. on space as a whole. So yeah, I want your next one to be cultivating the off, you know, like the 
that delivering happiness. Uh, yeah, so, but that's, thank, a good, that's a good idea. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie. I really appreciate it. If you're ever in Chicago, you know, let me know. Sure, All will right. do. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.